Hi, my name is Dr. Alex Bettis. I am a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in the psychiatry department at Vanderbilt Medical Center. And today I'm gonna to be presenting on my research looking at emotion regulation, flexibility, and suicide risk, understanding how we can better help teens during moments of crisis. I want to acknowledge uh, that I've received funding support from the National Institute of Mental Health through a K-23 award um, and pilot funding from the American Psychological Foundation that supports this work. I have no other conflicts of interest or disclosures to report. So I want to start by talking about the scope of the problem. Why is it important that we research suicide in adolescents? Well, we know that suicide has consistently been the second leading cause of death uh, in US teens. And this has been um, true for teens between the ages of 10 and 24 for many years now. And while rates of suicide death are incredibly alarming and concerning, um, it's important to know that many more teens in the US will go on to experience suicidal thoughts or to engage in suicidal behaviors than will die by suicide. Uh, in fact, data from the 2019 CDC Youth Behavior Risk Survey found that of high school teens, nearly 20% reported that in the past year they had thought about suicide. Nearly 16% uh, had reported uh, in the past year that they had made a plan for how they might try to end their life. And nearly 10% of teens in the past year had reported that they had actually made a non-fatal suicide attempt. These numbers are really alarming and highlight how suicide really is a public health emergency among our youth. It's also important to note that um, there's a growing amount of evidence that shows that youth are at heightened risk for suicide during relatively short periods of elevated emotional arousal. And these short periods of elevated arousal are often precipitated by interpersonal stress. We know that interpersonal stressors are particularly salient during the adolescent developmental period. And when we think about short-term periods of risk, what we mean is really periods of 15 to 30 minutes where teens are experiencing really acute distress, really elevated emotional arousal. It's during these brief periods, and they could experience multiple of these in a day, that we become most concerned that they're gonna go from thinking about suicide to actually acting on those thoughts. However, there have been relatively few studies that have actually looked at factors that might contribute to short-term suicide risk or tell us something about short-term suicide prediction among adolescents. In some pilot data that I collected on fellowship, we recruited about 31 teens who were admitted to an inpatient or partial hospital program at Bradley Hospital. Um, and we asked them to rate their intensity of their suicidal ideation several times a day um, over the course of two weeks after leaving the hospital. And what we found is that there was quite a bit of variability in mean levels of SI severity throughout those two, that two week period. So you see here, there's several teens who are clustered at the bottom where they're really not experiencing a lot of suicidal ideation. But then you have other teens who are jumping sort of all over the map throughout that two week period. And this would signal to us that some of these teens are experiencing these acute periods of elevated emotional arousal that we're really concerned about. Turning to some of the processes that might be relevant to telling us about suicide risk, one area that my research focuses on is emotion regulation. Emotion regulation really refers to a multidimensional construct that involves any efforts, anything we do to try to influence our experience of or expression of emotions. And in research, emotion regulation is commonly studied at two levels. One is the strategy level. So what are the specific things that people are doing to try to make themselves feel better or make themselves feel differently. Um, these strategies might include things like distraction or cognitive reappraisal or restructuring. Uh, and then we can also think about emotion regulation at the process level. How does it unfold? How do we engage in emotion regulation over time? And that brings us really to an overarching and relatively new construct called emotion regulation flexibility. This is really getting at an individual's ability to respond adaptively um, to their environment and to regulate emotions adaptively under many different contexts. And this is thought to include three sequential components. So when we think about someone in, uh, experiencing a stressful event or being in a given circumstance that would bring up a strong emotional response, whether it's positive or negative, 
in turn, someone might have an emotion regulation response, might try to do something to either downregulate or upregulate that emotion. How teens engage in those emotion regulation responses, particularly when they're in that elevated state of emotional arousal, may confer greater risk for suicidal behavior or may be protective in some way. And that's really the core at what I'm interested in. There are three parts of the emotion regulation response that I'm hoping to measure in my work and get a better understanding of. This includes context sensitivity. How well can you um, assess the context around you and then go on to pick a strategy that's gonna fit that context. The second step in the process is to pick a strategy. It's strategy selection. What are you going to do or what things are you going to do to try to downregulate or upregulate that emotional experience? After that, you implement the strategy. You actually try to do it. How well you implement it, um, we don't really know a whole lot about that in these short-term periods of emotional arousal that might confer risk. But also, once you implement the strategy, you may need to modify it. You may need to monitor your own response in the context around you and then adjust accordingly. So this is really thought to be a continuous process that happens over and over again throughout the day as we're experiencing things that bring up strong emotions. We also know that in addition to these behavioral and cognitive ways of responding and regulating our emotions, we also have physiological responses to stressful events and to these strong emotions. And that these physiological responses, particularly when we think about heart rate variability and electrodermal activity might tell us something about how flexible or inflexible someone's emotion regulation responses are. Going back to the pilot data that we collected when I was on fellowship at Brown, um, we asked kids to tell us something about the, the number of and the type of strategies that they were using in response to stress in the 14 days after they left the hospital. Uh, and here, this is again, just looking at the mean number of strategies that they reported using each day. Uh, each line is a different teen. And what we see here is that there's a lot of variability. So we have some kids who are only using one or two strategies or no strategies at all over that two week period. But we also have kids who are kind of jumping all over the map and some are reporting as many as three, four, five, up to seven or eight strategies in a given day in an effort to regulate their emotions. This data is really preliminary and we have a lot more to learn from this and actually we'll be expanding on this project for the K-23 project I'm gonna talk about here in just a minute. So why is it that we care about emotion regulation in the context of suicide risk, especially in teens? First, we know that many prominent theories of suicide include the dysregulation of emotions as part of the pathway to suicidal behavior. So this work was really spearheaded by Marsha Linehan, but it's been incorporated into many prominent suicide theories since then. We also know that many evidence-based psychosocial interventions for youth who are at risk for suicide really emphasize and have central to their intervention the importance of emotion regulation skills. This is true both for interventions that target acute periods of suicide risk like safety planning and for interventions that target uh, and teach kids how to manage risk over time like dialectical behavior therapy, therapy for adolescents. Ultimately, it's, um, I think that the better we do at assessing emotion regulation processes um, during these periods of risk, then we might be able to more sensitively detect when kids are going to go into these high periods of risk. And that could help to inform what interventions we might want to um, deliver to try to prevent kids from engaging in suicidal behavior. There are several limits um, of prior research in this area that I hope to address through my K-23 project. Um, first, we know that much of the suicide research to date has examined long-term static risk factors that are assessed over periods of many months to years. So there are really not many studies yet that have been focused on these acute risk states. We also know that suicide is a low base rate behavior. So it is difficult to study uh, it either requires a very, very large sample size to get enough occurrences of that behavior to make meaningful inferences from your data, or that you identify a high risk population that you have access to to study um, that you might expect to see high rates of suicidal behavior so that you can indeed measure that as a meaningful outcome in your work. In addition, 
a lot of research that has been done on emotion regulation in particular has focused solely on categorizing a given strategy or set of strategies as uniformly adaptive or maladaptive, good or bad. And this, uh, the measurement of these strategies has really focused on these sort of static one-time self-report measures. So there's a lot to do here to do a better job of measuring really the flexibility piece of emotion regulation. So I'm hoping to achieve some of this in my K23 study, Emotion Regulation Flexibility and Suicide Risks Risk in Adolescents. In this study that was just funded in January of this year, um, we hope to enroll 90 adolescents who have been admitted to the Vanderbilt inpatient or partial hospital program for acute suicide risk. These are teens between the ages of 14 and 17. The first aim of the study is to get a better sense of our measures of emotion regulation flexibility. And in particular, we're interested in the relationship between behavioral indices of emotion regulation flexibility. So what strategies do you choose and under what context and how well do you implement them? But also, and looking at how that's related to physiological indices of emotion regulation flexibility. Second, we aim to look at whether these indices of emotion regulation flexibility or inflexibility are predictive of suicide risk over a three month follow up period. Uh, and lastly, we want to look at day to day associations between interpersonal stress and emotion regulation flexibility. Um, and suicide risk in daily life. So using an ecological momentary assessment protocol, can we better disentangle if something about stress and emotion regulation flexibility can tell us uh, subsequently about when kids enter into periods of acute suicide risk. So we're gonna do this by doing a baseline assessment where kids will complete tasks while they're still in the hospital and measures of emotion regulation flexibility. We'll follow them up for three months where we'll track suicide events over this three month high risk period. And then we'll ask kids to complete a two week EMA protocol immediately after discharging from the hospital where we're gonna be asking them about their momentary experiences of stress their emotion regulation responses, and their both suicidal thoughts and behaviors uh, occurring throughout the day in that two week period. Ultimately, I hope that this work um, will then um, help us to expand our assessment methods. And I hope over the long term to add in ambulatory psychophysiological assessment to this work, as well as uh, potentially uh, looking at digital trace data collection through teams social media accounts. I also hope this work will directly inform the development of ecological momentary interventions that we can test whether delivering skills in the moment to teens might help to prevent them from going into these acute uh, emotional arousal periods. And I also hope to, in the future, extend this work to broader stressor contexts where we might look at things like digital emotion regulation or how kids engage in these processes and social media, because we know that's a lot of um, kids are spending a lot of their time right now in that context. Just answering a few common questions very quickly before I wrap up. Why recruit teens from these two acute care settings? Well, this comes back to the issue of suicide being a low base rate behavior. And so we need to recruit kids who we know might be at particularly high risk for suicidal behavior since I'm only able to recruit 90 kids for this study. Through our pilot data, we did find that it was both feasible and acceptable to ask these kids who are um, leaving an acute treatment setting to fill out five daily surveys on their phone. We have relatively good compliance. Not every kid is going to be super compliant, and that is to be expected, but we did find that it was feasible and acceptable. Um, and lastly, we Again, hope that these data will directly inform ecological momentary interventions that we can deliver for kids in the moment, in that period when they're transitioning out of acute services so that we can do a better job of supporting them when they leave intensive services, and keep them from engaging in suicidal behavior and hopefully also keep them out of the hospital. So with that, I want to conclude and just say thank you to my K23 mentors. Um, I have a really wonderful team of support uh, who have helped me at every stage in this project. Thank you to my current lab members and thank you to the funding agencies who have supported this work.